As we begin today, uh, we're gonna talk about pausing and rejoicing when it comes to prayer. Pausing and rejoicing. And I wanna start with what I call the parable of the two daughters. A father, a very lucky, blessed father, he had two daughters. He loved them, he raised them, he provided for them, he tried to shape them and guide them like any loving parent would so that they would be able to live life well, that they'd be able to contribute, that they would be whole and healthy, good members of society, prepared for life, all of the normal parenting stuff. And as happens with our kids, even though it seems to happen a little bit later in life, mostly these days, it came time for them to leave home, for them to leave the nest. The two daughters left, and the first one went about her life. She went off to university, she dated a few boys, she went into her career, and she would call home and visit every now and then, but it was mainly when she needed something. She needed some money, she needed her heart consoled because the latest relationship hadn't worked out, she needed her car fixed, or it topped up with fuel, or she needed somewhere to stay for a few nights. The second daughter went about her life in much of the same way, except she rung home every week. She called just to see how dad was doing, to share stories about how their lives were going, to connect, to listen, Yep, and dad helped her, no doubt, but the relationship went far beyond just the desperate need. And I wonder when you consider the parable of the two daughters, which daughter do you think enjoyed the richest relationship with the father? Of course, it's the second daughter. It's the one who understood that Parents are there for more than just meeting needs, but to enjoy relationship with. And when it comes to prayer, prayer is so much more than asking. Prayer is no less than asking. There is huge elements of pray, praying that is to ask. In fact, we use prayer sort of interchangeably with ask. Right? We go, I'm gonna pray to God about that. What we really mean is I'm gonna ask God for that. And so the words are almost interchangeable, but the, the struggle with that is, is that the idea of prayer is so much bigger than asking. And it's because prayer is mainly, and it's firstly, and it's, fundamentally about relationship. It's about enjoying relationship with God. It's about having relationship with God. It's about knowing God and feeling known by Him. And it includes asking, but it's so much more than asking. The reality is, is that prayer shapes us. Prayer is very fundamental to human beings. Even in an amazingly secular society, if you ask people if they've prayed before, even without a clear, coherent, religious sort of idea or philosophy or belief system, they would probably say they've prayed. They don't know what they've prayed to or who they've prayed to, but it's something about us that we want to we want to connect to the supernatural in some way. And prayer, prayer shapes us, but the problem is without a rhythm, without a form, without, you know, some would say a liturgy, but without some sort of intentional design to our prayer, prayer might not shape us into the person that Jesus wants us to be if we don't pray like Jesus. Because here's what I've noticed about humanity is that consumeristic people led, left to themselves will pray consumeristic prayers. We just wrap some faith, name it and claim it language around it. And angry people will pray angry prayers. And selfish people will pray selfish prayers. And it will just reinforce where we're at with the veneer of spirituality. 
And so we don't just want to be people who pray. We want to be people who pray like Jesus prayed so that we might begin to look a little bit more like him. I've heard some people, and this is one of the things in the series around prayer, you could think of prayer, like through the Lord's Prayer, you could think of it as an acronym, P, R, A, and Y. P, pause, R, rejoice, A, ask, there it is, it's there. And Y, yield, or in kids' church, we'll be teaching them, just say yes. Maybe we should just have that elementary level here. Yield, huh? Yes, okay. Yes, Lord. And so we start with pause. Why do we pause before we pray? I, 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 I want to just, I guess, diverge for a moment. Hey, you can pray on the go. You can pray in the car. You can pray without ceasing in your day. And, and that, is, that is absolutely, as our spiritual lives grow, that's absolutely what should happen. There's a sense of like prayer is a thing that we're just coming in and out of all of the time in our lives. But to develop that type of awareness needs the intentional practices of prayer. As Jesus said, sort of like close the closet door behind you, go to the secret place and just be with the Lord. We, we need, and so I'm talking about prayer as in the intentional prayer, not just the prayer on the go. We're already too on the go as people. We need some pause if we're truly going to have a prayer that shapes us. And so we start with the pause because we're tempted to look at our lives through a microscope, right? We're, we're tempted if we're just left to our own devices to zoom in way too much. I don't know about you, I get fixated on stuff. Anyone get fixated on things? And sometimes you need a bit of gratitude or you need just someone to sort of shake you or you need to come across somebody else's suffering to just get out of the microscope. Pause is an opportunity to pull out the telescope in your life, to see a bit bigger, to see a, a bit further. It's been said that it's very hard to follow God in a hurry. Because of that, our prayer needs pause. Our souls, I don't know about yours, but mine certainly is. My soul's quite shy. It's sort of in the busyness of life, in the hurries of life, in the scurrying of life, it retreats. I don't know where to, but it goes somewhere deep inside. It's nowhere near on the surface. I'm not much of a hunter. In fact, I'm not one at all. <laughs> But like a deer in the forest, if there's too much noise around, it retreats and hides, so do our souls. But if we can pause, if we can be still, if we can wait for a moment, the deepest part of us has an opportunity to begin to come out. And this so matters in prayer because Prayer is not just a, a mental connection or not just a heart connection or not just a words connection. Prayer is most profound and powerful when it's a soul connection. And we need the pause for the soul connection. I know what some people would be thinking as we talk about prayer. Gosh, I already know I don't pray enough. I don't need eight weeks about being reminded of that. You know, feeling guilty about not praying enough has never made someone pray more. So you could probably just lay that aside. That's not gonna be helpful, that sort of guilt. It doesn't take us to the Father. It doesn't cause us to be excited to see Him. Perhaps a prayer to the Lord in your pause to say, Lord, give me a hunger for your presence. Lord, I want to pray more, teach me. Might be a better place to begin. I don't know about you, when I begin to pause to start praying, it's like my mind comes out of first gear and turns into about 20th gear. Is anyone else's mind like that? It's like, okay, God, I'm gonna pray. Just, just you and me, pause. And then a thousand thoughts. 
none of which have anything to do with the Lord. Right, just like, and then I realise I've gone down a rabbit's trail thinking, God, I'm coming back to you. I heard it said like this, a thousand distractions is just a thousand opportunities to return to the Father. Don't you love that? So this week, as you practice your pause before you pray and as everything starts swirling around and you start to panic, just think I'm normal. And every opportunity is an opportunity to come back to the Lord. Sometimes on holiday, we like to go to the lake. You can sit by the lake, you have a picnic on the lake and on a really good day, it's just beautiful, it's flat, it's still, it's quiet. And then someone comes along in one of those wake boats. (laughs) And other than admiring and wishing I had one, they ruin all of the peace, right? All of a sudden the wake comes It starts splashing. If you're sitting too close to the edge, you get wet. Kids start screaming or whatever. And your little toddlers are overwhelmed. Now all of a sudden there's a swell bigger than them. But if we just pause and wait, the lake will go flat again. Pausing in prayer is so important to have a soul connection with the Lord. And then we begin to rejoice. Let us recite the Lord's Prayer. Katie did it last week. I wanted to do it again this week. Do we have have it up there? You guys ready? Are you going to go with me? Okay, good. Our Father in heaven. Do we say amen? Okay, amen. We're just gonna zoom on these first two lines today. The disciples came to Jesus. Jesus, teach us to pray. He prayed this prayer. He said, pray like this. And so we get a model for prayer. As Katie said last week, simple enough for a child to grasp, but profound enough to fuel an entire life of prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Rejoice. Look, we either don't pray probably for one of three reasons. The first, and I would say this is probably the most common, is pride. It's the sin of self-sufficiency. We see no real need for the Lord or for him to be involved in our business, or for us to be involved in his, except when we get desperate. So pride keeps us away. The second might be lack of habit. And the third, perhaps just as common as the first, is an inaccurate picture of God. This prayer begins and it says, our. That's an important word, our. Not my. God's not mine. He's ours. He's our God. It invites us into an identity in prayer that is communal, not individual. Jesus says, pray our, not my. Okay, well, I'll start there, God. I, imagine how much your view of the world, of even just church would change if you didn't pray my, but you prayed our. Every day for the rest of your life, you might see the world slightly differently just by changing that one word because prayer shapes us. And then he goes, our Father. And we... This father word is a bit of an issue because not many people don't have some level of daddy issues. Some element of hang-ups because of our earthly fathers and either the type of presence they were or the type of absence they were. And when Jesus says, pray like this, our father in heaven, he blows their minds apart. It's not that they didn't understand in ancient Israel that God was like a father. It just wasn't the major, the primary way they saw God. They maybe would have been more comfortable praying our Lord, our King, our God. But he says, pray our Father. And so as we begin our prayers, we want to begin by rejoicing in the correct image of God's intimacy, 
of God's love. We want to rejoice in his intimacy, if you're taking notes. We want to begin our prayer meditating on this, celebrating this, speaking out this. The, the father, the father who says to Jesus, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Before he's done anything, before he's achieved anything, before he's fulfilled his purpose, my son in whom I'm well pleased. Given that our salvation is not by effort, it's not by our works or our goodness, we might safely assume that the Father's sentiment would be the same towards us. My son, my daughter, whom I love. Whom I love. Before you've done anything, before you've got any betterer, any gooderer, any praying morer, Before you've done any of that, you are loved. When Jesus was given the opportunity to tell a story so that people might start to understand this Father in heaven, he tells the story of the prodigal son. And he says this in Luke 15. So the prodigal son returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. This is the son who said he wished he was dead. The Father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion is our heavenly Father. He ran to his son, he embraced him, he kissed him. And his son said to him, ready with his big, you know, poor me apology speech, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer even worthy to be called your son. But his father would have none of it. He said to his servants, quick, not after he's done his time, not after he's paid his penance, not after he's made it up, not after he's been a good Christian for a year. Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. This is my glorious son. Get a ring on his finger so he has my authority. Get sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party begins. I don't know if you've seen this work of art, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt. I love the book by Henry Nouwen, the same name, after spending a lifetime pondering God's love and a whole day sitting in St. Petersburg staring at this painting, he writes this very profound book about all of the elements. We see the father embracing the son. We see the servants in the background. We see the older brother looking on. And I just, this is our heavenly father. This is, his, this is Rembrandt had lived an a, a, a interesting life. And in, in sometimes in his life, he was the younger son. And other times in his life, he was the older brother. And I think he hoped to finish as a mirror of the Father. And so after a lifetime of sin and getting everything wrong, he tried to paint everything right. Look at the sun, look at the tattered clothes, look at the lost shoe, look at the, just nothing to show that he is of royal or noble or worthy. He's got nothing. And here's the father. Look at, look at the father's face. Look at the, not the authoritative, strong, straight look. Look at the tilted head of compassion. Look at the eyes of kindness. Look at the hands, soft and embrace. Our father in heaven. I don't know about you, but I often can feel like the son. And sometimes our images of the father can stop us coming to him in prayer, but he is our father in heaven. The one who embraces us, the one who says, you are my beloved. And man, when we begin to get that, prayer is no longer a thing we feel like we have to do. It's something we long to call up our dad and just talk about life. 
he loves. We don't, these, these sort of, if we can put the two lines up again, these two lines also almost work to hold our perspective of God in tension. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in his intimacy. Hallowed be your name, we rejoice in his greatness. We don't, we, we have an incredible, friendly, loving God and we should embrace and rejoice that intimacy, but not so much that we drag him down to our level. That we should keep a holy reverence for him too. The two lines cause us in our rejoicing part of the prayer is the I'm the beloved and he is, he is the one who loves me and I'm just pondering this and I'm dwelling in this, but he is also amazing. He's so far beyond. Another translation would say his name should be kept holy. It should be kept separate. It should be kept apart. He is great. He's the creator of the world. His wisdom is too big to contain in my feeble little brain. When I think I'm out thinking God, I'm a fool. He is so great. His grandeur, his holiness, his otherness. Hallowed be your name is like, maybe in just modern translation, you say, you deserve to be worshipped all over the earth. You are worthy of it. I mean, we get bored of three or four songs and having to have our hands up for more than one bridge or a chorus. But man, you could be on your knees and sing at the top of your lungs with your hands raised until the sockets fall out and you still wouldn't have sung enough praise that he would have filled up his worthiness tank. And so we rejoice in his greatness. We just ponder him. We, we get the telescope out, right? I don't know, you, you go camping and you're away from some city lights and for one of the three times in your life you get to see all of the stars. You can actually see the Milky Way and you just look up at it and it's beautiful and it's amazing. I don't know about you, I've never looked up and gone, gosh, I'm amazing. <laughs> right, like it, it takes us beyond ourselves. And so as we rejoice in his greatness, we're getting taken beyond ourselves. And so the rest of our prayer might find its context in the fact that we've first rejoiced. When we do this, our crisis gets some context. Rejoicing puts our lives in context. Uh, uh, we've got another piece of art here by Filipino Lippi. And uh, here's another great Renaissance painter, and this one's called The Virgin and the Child. And like, you know, his works go for multi, multi millions, they're just, they're, they're priceless. But this piece of art, um, people always thought was pretty average. It, it, it pictures Mary and the child and then two saints, Saint Jerome and Saint uh, Dominic. Um, not that they all existed at the same time, I don't get what he's doing, but um, someone who studied uh, history. You, you might, but anyway. Um, but people always thought like, he didn't quite nail this one. Like it's not up to the rest of the standard of his, of his works because they felt like, and I'm not like an art critic because like, I would feel like this is really good. But um, like they feel like the perspective's all out. Like it looks like the mountains, like art critics comment about how it looks like the mountains aren't in perspective and like they're sort of gonna topple in. They're, they're supposed to be set in the background, but they sort of look like they're all up in Mary's grill there. It's my clearly really good art critic. Um, but then a very famous art critic staring at this painting one day realized it was never designed to be hung in a gallery but it was designed as an altarpiece to be knelt before. And he knelt before the artwork, and it doesn't work on the screen, so we're not gonna try, you're already looking up at it. Unless you're up there, you're looking down on it. He knelt before it, and it came into perfect perspective. When we rejoice in the Lord, our lives start to come into perfect perspective. Our struggles, our unanswered prayers, our crises, our needs, they all start to come into perspective when we first rejoice in the Lord. 
when we rejoice in the Lord, it will help us in our lives hold the mystery of why God answers some prayers and not others. Because he'll answer some of yours and he won't answer others. And if you're not careful, you'll be bitterly disappointed if you haven't first rejoiced in how amazing he is. I heard it said like this, I don't wanna have a big faith in a small God. I wanna have a mustard seed of faith in a really big God. Sometimes we want a version of faith that makes us so sure of everything that we make God so small and we make our faith so big like he can be commanded to do things. But rejoicing in the Lord keeps him big and us properly small. And thankfully, in the words of Jesus, all you need is a mustard seed of faith. In the dramas of our last year, It's been rejoicing in the Lord that can help me when I get to the asking to go, Lord, but not my will, but yours be done. It helps me to let go. It helps me to yield. It helps me to move from prayer in a place of peace and trust, not frustration and anger because I've put God in the proper place. We're commanded to rejoice in him, not because God's like, you know, I don't know what the word would be, just super self-obsessed. We're not commanded, like some people, oh, well, he commands us to worship him. What a, you know, I don't know what they say things that I shouldn't say in church probably. Is he needy? Does he, does he need it? No, it's, it's got nothing to do with that. He commands us to rejoice in him because as we rejoice in him, we begin to enjoy him. The Westminster Confession, the founding document of the Presbyterian Church, says, what is the chief end of man? A man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. As we rejoice in him, we enjoy him. As we proclaim him, as we ponder his intimacy, as we rejoice in his greatness and enjoyment of him. We we shouldn't be surprised by this because when we rejoice in anyone, we enjoy them more. When we rejoice in our spouse, we enjoy them. When we, yes, the band can come. When we rejoice in uh, our families, Like we enjoy them more. When we rejoice in our children, we enjoy them. When we rejoice in our parents, we enjoy them, right? When we ponder how awesome they are, when we think about all the good things and we dwell on that, we start to enjoy them more than when we weren't, maybe when we were focusing on all the other stuff. But the trouble is, is that I don't know about your marriage. I've got a great marriage. Katie said, when you're telling the story, make sure you tell them. We're all good, okay? (laughs) But you know, there's times, there's times where it's an overflow, right? There's a time where you don't have to muster up any like rejoicing. It's, It's there, you're just overwhelmed. Probably on your wedding day, you know, it's like, it's just, it's there. Hello. Wow. Hey, Bruce. It's your phone. (laughs) Is that you, Lord? (laughs) No, not busy. Yeah, yeah, I can talk. Uh, Fire away. So good. I didn't have many jokes in my message, so that was quite helpful. (laughs) You know, sometimes birthday or anniversary rolls around and I can't wait to write the card because I've got some stuff I want to say. Sometimes we had a really bad day the day before and I got to write it anyway. But as I do, I begin to enjoy This is the same with the Lord. We don't always feel like singing to Him. We don't always feel like praying to Him. We don't always feel it, 
but we do it anyway. Like David would say, awake my soul and worship the Lord. He says, soul, bless the Lord. And he commands himself to do what he knows is good. And so church, as we're here today, and we go about this week of going deeper in prayer, let's pause and let's rejoice. Because as we do, we reclaim prayer as firstly relational, but we also enjoy Him so much more when we do it.